This is Doug Farrar, NFL writer with Sports Press Northwest, and I'm here with co-founder Art Thiel. Uh, we're talking about the labor situation in the NFL as it stands now with the lockout, uh, possible mediation that could still go forward, and the antitrust ruling, which we now know will start on April 6th in the Minnesota District Court of Susan Nelson. Uh, but Art, at Sports Press, we believe that the past is prologue. So I wanted to get a, a sense from you because you worked for the Seattle PI for 30 years, and have you talk about the strike in 87, the Plan B free agency in 89, the antitrust ruling in 92, and how those things really set up what we're going through now? It was a remarkable day, the, the most unusual day I think I've ever had covering sports, which was in uh, October of 1987, the union had struck, and at the Kingdom, fans were coming in past a line of, uh, of players holding picket signs. They were, it was just a, a, the classic strike pose. But once the game started, once the fans were inside, this was against Miami, the players retreated to Swanee's Bar in Pioneer Square. And we're talking about people uh, that longtime Seahawks fans remember, such as Mike Tice, Edwin Bailey, Paul Moyer, and uh, Joe Nash. These, are, these guys were on the lines. Swanee said, hey, when you're done picketing, come by. We're going to have uh, uh, beer and pretzels and hot dogs, and and that's where they watched the Seahawks play the Dolphins. The Seahawks were watching the Seahawks play the Dolphins. That was uh, an altogether remarkable year. The, the Seahawks players in the bar were criticizing the Seahawks players who'd come off the street and put their uniforms on, and there were fans of the players and the union position inside, but what really shocked the players that day, and this I think resonates to this day now, is that the Fans who came out of the kingdom, who cheered uh, and paid full price for watching this game, said, we want scabs, we want scabs. So the NFL Players Association, based on that experience, is certainly taking a risk that they're going to alienate fans because many fans, not all fans, and I can't even say most fans, but many fans are going to look at what they're doing in context of their own lives, right. whether you work at Boeing or Starbucks or wherever, and you're going, they're going to be upset with the players for making millions and apparently seeming to be greedy, wanting more millions when they've already got such a good deal. That doesn't consider the fact that the average NFL career is three years in length and that there are a lot of other issues here besides money. But that situation evolved in 1987 to what is known as Plan B, in 1989, that was uh, an attempt by the owners uh, to create free agency, but only for the bottom third of the players in the roster, the guys who were not difference makers, the guys who were not under uh, long-term contracts because of their value to the teams. Plan B was struck down in 1992 uh, as uh, being a, uh, a restraint of trade, and that victory in court ushered in the free agency in 1993 that the NFL has operated under since then. So this history is, uh, this the history of labor strife has been long and arduous and it started with a strike in 1987 and the decisive action in 1992 on the players' behalf was to decertify the union. That has happened again this time in order to allow the players to represent themselves in a trade association, not a union, and therefore in, uh, hampering the NFL's ability to uh, bargain with everybody as one, which is an advantage for the NFL. So by decertifying, the uh, players are attempting to gain leverage in this agreement now as they did back in 1992. It is a lockout, it is not a strike yet. The players are willing to play under the old terms, but right now we're stymied because rather than negotiate, uh, both parties have walked down the plank of litigation. So Doug, now catch us up a little bit on where we are today, uh, how we got here, and what is next in terms of litigation. Just pause for well, really what happened in 1993 with the free agency 
it was an untold era of prosperity for the NFL because with true free agency, with a salary cap for the first time, every team really had an opportunity to compete, not just at a Super Bowl level, but at a, a level which brought enough excellence to the field for fans to become interested in a way they never had been before. And this brought in up to, in 2010, in the 2010 season, a $9.6 billion gross revenue from tickets, TV contracts, everything. Basically now, what the two sides are arguing over is two instances of the number 18. The first instance is the 18-game season, which the owners want. They want it to go up from 16 to 18 regular season games to preseason games for more revenue for their side. Now, what the owners will say is that by dint of those extra two games, the players will get more revenue. That's not really true because of the second instance of the number 18, which is the 18% give back. The owners want to defray costs of stadium debt, training camp, and you know, bottles of Gatorade down to the last little thing. The players have said, so you essentially want us to play longer for less money, taking us back financially to pre-1993 levels. Basically, the owners in their first proposals to the players wanted to pretend that free agency, uh, the type we know of, never existed and that we were kind of back in plan B. What that got us was a ruling in Judge David Doty's court in, in Minnesota District Court. Doty is also the guy who uh, made the antitrust ruling in 92, that the owners had set up quote unquote lockout insurance in extensions of TV deals in which they said, we will give you digital rights fees, we will give you extra games in exchange for a promise that if there is a lockout in 2011, you will pay us TV money anyway. This was basically a loan uh, against future revenues from the TV networks to the NFL. That's how it was originally portrayed. What came out in Judge Doty's appeal of Stephen Burbank's original ruling is that the NFL had strong-armed certain networks, especially DirecTV, into essentially agreeing to guarantee funds that were not loans, even if there was a lockout. This is how powerful the NFL is right now as an income giver to everybody. So what Doty said is not only are we taking the $4 billion in lockout insurance you had away, but he made specific language in his ruling about restraint of trade, about collusive action, about possible antitrust statutes going forward that really affected the owner's ability to stay out of antitrust trouble as well as sort of bank money for a future lockout, essentially funding it. Now, what that did was it put the two sides in the federal mediation building with George Cohen for two weeks, at which point they tried to get a deal done, didn't happen. The NFL locked the players out at midnight last Friday. The players filed, uh, after the certification, the same type of lawsuit. This, type, this time it's called uh, Brady, as in Tom Brady versus the NFL. So if the players win it, last time it was called the Reggie White rule because Reggie White was the main plaintiff. This time it would be basically the Tom Brady rule. Uh, the players are seeking to enjoin the owners from locking them out again. That's basically where we stand now. So what happened was uh, Judge Doty gave a major victory to the union in his court ruling that at least leveled the playing field in terms of uh, negotiating leverage but it turned out to be insufficient to avoid the lockout and the desert that we saw now. Right, so, well the, the ruling actually swung the advantage in a major way over to the players because when they had that four billion in their coffers, the owners were acting very hawkish, they were insulting the players in meetings, they were doing all sorts of things which basically insinuated we don't wanna solve this because we have enough money to fund two years of lockouts, we're just gonna stalemate you guys. Now it was different, and it was Doty's ruling that sort of swung the pendulum to the union side and got everyone back on that even keel to at least get in a room and try and figure it out. Now, so we're in a situation now where the NFL, in terms of its revenues, has never been more ro robust. The sport has never been more popular. So rather than create a sense of crisis in terms of the individual clubs uh, financial futures, which we've seen in the NBA, which we've seen in the NHL, which we've seen in Major League Baseball, 
the NFL position is that we have never been more successful, but the only reason we want to change the rules of collective bargaining is to be more successful because there is no franchise, as far as you know, that's in any financial jeopardy. So there are, this is a, a move from the owner's position of ultimate strength because not only can they attempt to dictate to the players, they're dictating to the television network. Right. They can't because no one's dumb enough to believe that any NFL team is losing money. So what they're actually saying right now is we're not losing money, but our current business model is unsustainable. And they're not willing to open the books to present fully audited, line-by-line, -line profit and loss statements to the players. And this is where I believe the players are in the right. The players are saying, you want us to essentially give back another billion dollars off the top. Because it's important to remember that the first billion off the top in gross revenue goes to the owners for cost givebacks. It's excluded from the revenue share. Right. So now the eight billion would be seven billion, and that extra billion would go to the owners. And the players are saying, "Well, if you want to essentially give back eighteen percent, we want to see the books. We want to know why." Now that makes sense in the abstract, in a larger business sense. When you're talking about business partners, I think what the fan doesn't realize is that you know the fan says, "Well, if I work at Boeing and I get a a a, a, a dip in pay." because the business isn't going well, as many businesses aren't, I can't go to my boss and say, open the books. The difference with the NFL is there's no, if you don't like the way you're being paid or the way you're being dealt with, you can go to another industry. You can right. go to- There's not, you not another league because right. this is a monopoly operation. Exactly. So that's the difference in so far as the legal maneuvering plus the fact that the players provide such an income and it's such a specific skill set that they've trained all their lives for, it's a little different. And that's why they're going forward as a trade organization. There are specific legal aspects to that strategy. And that's why they believe they're in the right, uh, no matter who hears the case. There was rumors that Doty would hear the antitrust case as well. But in this case, it'll be Susan Nelson. This is why the players believe they're on the right side of law, because the owners have not opened their books. They have not said exactly why they need this 18% give back. There's still no illumination on that fact. And when you take, all the, take away all the invective from both sides, that's really what we're left with. But the argument the owners are using is that the money that is excluded from revenue sharing, they're going to dedicate to funding stadiums which in theory is a good thing because you're not asking the taxpayers to pay as much for any new stadium construction because the NFL will privately fund a portion of that. Now, uh, uh, Roger Goodell, the NFL commissioner, has argued that no stadium project has begun since 2006 because the, uh, this kind of funding is not available to them. Do you get a sense that all of this money is going to be dedicated to relieving taxpayers of the burden of uh, funding stadiums. No. Uh, and the <laughs> there's a lot of disingenuousness going on on both sides. And for Goodell to say that, I mean, Cowboy Stadium, the, the, the majority of the stadium debt happened after 06. In the New Meadowlands, the majority of the stadium debt happened after 06. So for Goodell to say, well, the starting gun didn't hit, come on. And, that, <laughs> and that's a lot of what you get right now is a bunch of for no, for no better term, BS on both sides about what they're, you know, th what they want the public to believe. The problem with the whole concept of stadium debt is again, open the books, show us what the stadium debt is, show us on an accrual basis, year to year, what sort of debt you're incurring. The players are saying, and the players have said from Pete Kendall on down, if there are specific things that will grow revenue that we can add to through givebacks, we'll do it. They said that for years. So the problem goes back to the owner's inability to open the books in a fully audited way that the players are demanding before they give back all this money. I think that's about all the time we have for the discussion on the labor issues here. This is going to be a regular feature of Sports Press Northwest, discussions of the issues of the day in sports. Uh, I'm Art Teal with Doug Farrar. Thanks for watching.